Welcome to the Vision Driven Basketball Training Podcast. Coach Ethan here. Super excited to have you guys listening. Really appreciate it. Whether you guys are listening on, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, watching on YouTube, I appreciate it. If you guys are on Apple Podcasts, I would really appreciate it if you guys would scroll down to the bottom of the page and leave a five-star review. really helps me out. helps more people be able to see the podcast. So that's a, that's really a big thing for me, uh, but I would appreciate that. If you're on YouTube, make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Uh, today, you know, I want to get into a, a pretty pressing topic. Actually, I was inspired to talk about this because I heard the guys over at By Any Means Basketball, shout out to them, they actually did a podcast on this exact topic, and I kind of wanted to give my spin on it, give my thoughts on the same thing. They were talking about how the coronavirus and how quarantine is going to change basketball for at least the, the next few years, most likely. And we're seeing trends that have started before all this happened. And now that we're actually in the midst of the whole quarantine and everything like that, you know, those trends are starting to become more and more pronounced. So I kind of want to talk about that, talk about how to maximize your quarantine and uh, a bunch of stuff along with that. I'll answer a couple questions as well. So I'm going to hop into it. You know, kind of the whole the whole theme for this episode is is really about self-discipline because I think that's the biggest thing we talk about why quarantine is going to change basketball forever. And I I think the the number one thing is that self-discipline is the key going forward if you want to be successful as a basketball player. Now, the reason I say that is because the players moving forward who are going to be successful are the ones who don't need their coach or their trainer to hold their hands and and really have to guide them 100% of the time. Okay, the players who are going to be successful, the guys who are going to be committed to figuring things out, maybe on their own, like they might have to actually figure something out for themselves instead of having their coach tell them what to do. Their coach say, okay, we're getting in the gym at this time, this day, be there. All they got to do is show up. Okay, the players who right now are going to become successful are the ones who are saying, okay, what do I need to do to maximize my skills? What drills do I need to do? A lot of players have never really had to find drills for themselves because they're always working with their team or their trainer. And now that's it's different because you're not doing that. You have to figure out for yourself, what do I need to do? What drills are going to make me the most successful? How do I structure these drills to make them to, to see the most improvement? And I think that's where we're going to see the biggest difference with players is we're going to see the players who only play basketball because it's convenient. And we're going to see the players who actually really love it and, and care enough to figure out how to overcome the lack of resources they may have right now. So, I mean, this is a time where most players are, are essentially on their own. And this is, I mean, it's unprecedented because we've always had coaches with us. We've always had trainers. We've always had people around who, who can help us when we need help. And especially for younger players, too, who haven't had necessarily had the experience that older guys have had. So now it's all about, you know, and I think that's the great thing right now is there's so much content about what you should be doing at home drills you can do at home, workouts for, for home, and all the things you need to do. Like it, that's such a big thing right now in the basketball community. And I think that reason, it, it, that, that thing alone is going to help a ton of players. But you can have all the content out there in the world for you to see, but if you're not actually actively seeking it out, then you know, you're, not, you're not gonna see the, the, the results. So now it becomes about how disciplined are you? And the other word we can use is accountability, okay? I think the big thing now is, you know, in the past, players have been accountable to their coaches, their teammates. If you don't show up to your team workouts in the offseason, well, all your teammates are going to know, your coaches are going to know, and they might let you know about it. And even still, they might not let you know about it, but you know, like, okay, my teammates are all in the, in the gym getting better. I got to do that too if I want to play, okay? No longer is, is, that, is that the motivation that players are going to be able to have, okay? Because that's just not happening. So right now you have the opportunity to, to do nothing and nobody would really know because you're at home, right? You could tell people, Hey, I'm out here working, but you, you could just be sitting around doing nothing the whole day and nobody would know anything. You do not have to be accountable to anybody else right now. Okay. And that is another part of, of, of this whole thing that is completely new because we've always had accountability between teammates and coaches and, 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 and the individual player, but th- that's gone now. So, now the only person you're accountable to is yourself. The only person you that you really have to be disciplined and, and the only person you really have to look in the mirror and answer to is, is yourself when it comes to the work that you're doing. 
Now, there will, be, there will come a point down the road where you will have to be accountable for your actions now. What you're doing now, people are going to know in you know however long it takes. And th at that point, they'll know what you've done. But for now, you don't have to do anything. And you can completely, you don't have to feel any sort of way about that because there's no one who can tell you anything different. They don't know. So you have to understand that we're going to continue to see a bigger and bigger gap between the players who are self-disciplined, who hold themselves accountable, and the players who are only uh, disciplined when it comes to their coaches, their teammates. They're only held accountable by the other people in their lives. Okay, now listen, I am not saying that you should not be accountable to your teammates. You absolutely should be. I think the mark of a player who can actually be great is that they care about their teammates. They hold themselves accountable. You know, it's, it's the player who, and this is what I tell people, you know, the players who approach basketball differently, they approach it with a why. They approach it with, you know, it isn't just about going to practice and, and me doing my best. It's about saying, you know what, I'm tired, but I know the guy next to me is just as tired as me. So next sprint we're running, I'm going to make sure I'm encouraging him. I'm, I'm letting him know, let's go, man. We're going to get this next one, all right? And because of that, I'm now not just holding myself accountable, but I'm holding my teammates accountable and they hold me accountable. That's going to help raise everybody's game. So I'm not saying that hold, that, that you feel accountable to your teammates or coaches is a bad thing. It's a, it's a good thing. So there's a book called Relentless by a guy named Tim Grover. And Tim Grover was the trainer for Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade. And so he's got a ton of stories in that book. But essentially, the book is about what it takes to have the mindset of some of those guys who are great. Those the Michael Jordans, Kobe Bryant's, Dwayne Wade's, and the way that they approached basketball, and how you can sort of apply that as well. Uh, it's a great book, and I think everyone should read it, especially basketball players. But there's a part in the book where he was talking about the lockout, and that was between the 2011, 2012, the summer before that that season. So he was talking a little bit about, you know, how players were approaching the uh, the off season that year. And how a lot of them knew that there was going to be a shortened season. They didn't know when the season was going to start. All they knew is that it was going to be delayed. And so a lot of guys took that opportunity to kind of be like, eh, you know, I don't know when the season's going to start, so I'm not going to really, I'm not going to work out as much. So, like, I know Tim Grover was talking about how there were guys who didn't want to pay for trainers. They didn't want to get in the gym. They didn't want to do all this stuff because they didn't know when the season was going to start. And for a lot of those guys, when they got back, it, it all of a sudden – they the guys were getting hurt. They weren't ready to play because they weren't working at it because they were just like, oh, you know, what? I don't know when it's going to, I don't know when things are going to get back to normal. So what's even the point? So all of a sudden when things did get back to normal and they didn't necessarily get an adjustment period, bad things happened to them. But the guys, for example, Kobe Bryant, who he talked about in the book, Kobe was working out two or three times a day, every day during the, the lockout. Guys like that were ready to go when the time came because they held themselves accountable. It wasn't about what their teams are doing. It wasn't about what their teammates are doing. It was about what they were doing. And a guy like Kobe completely understood the the value of that. Okay, and that's again what makes him one of the greatest of all time. But that that mindset in itself, you know, not everyone's going to be as talented as Kobe Bryant is. But you can still apply the same exact mindset in, in the situation we're in right now, okay? Obviously, it's it's kind of similar situations with the whole lockout where we don't know when we'll be playing again. Things are different. Now, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's a quarantine. We don't know when we'll be playing again. We don't know when things are going to be getting back to normal. So what are you doing now to make sure you're ready when that time comes? That's all about being self-disciplined. So that, I, thought that, I thought that was a great story and really illustrated the fact that the guys who, who really want it are going to stay prepared. They're going to stay ready, and, and they're not going to allow the outside uh, influences to to distract them. I think that's what I think that's the, the difference when it comes to self discipline. Is you have to have an intrinsic force that motivates you to keep on going, even when the outside factors are working against you. Okay, so what that means is that you have to have your goal, your vision, right, and and you have to know how you're actually going to get there. And that in itself has to be what drives you to con to continue to work, even when things are are questionable. You don't know what exactly is going on. You continue to put the work in because you know that you need to get to your goal down the line, and that doesn't change because of whatever the circumstances are. Okay, so that, that's a, a mindset you can begin to develop right now. So, like I said, how do you develop this all this whole self accountability, self discipline? And like I said, number one, it's it's have a vision and write it down. Know what you want. What are your ultimate goals? What do you want to achieve next season? Okay, write that down. 
And then number two is you got to figure out what it's going to take to actually get there. Okay, so you, now you know where you want to go. Now, what is it going to take for you to get to that point? What, what kind of things do you need to do to achieve that? That's number two. And then number three is every day you want to set out daily tasks that you can do that are going to get you closer to that goal. Okay, so your goal might be, I want to, I want to be the starting point guard next year. So every day you're doing ball handling. Okay, you're going to write out for yourself exactly what you're going to do and you're going to stick to it. That's going to allow you to actually get it, move towards that goal as opposed to it just being just being a dream, just being a daydream. Okay, so those three steps are very important if you want to really continue to be self-disciplined. Again, I'm talking about the difference between guys who are going to make it in the long in the long term and the guys who won't are the guys who are self-disciplined versus the guys who are only disciplined when it comes to their teammates and their coaches. Okay, the guys who really want it now by themselves are going to feel so much uh, when by the time they get back and they now have the uh, the additional factor of their teammates and coaches holding them accountable, they're going to start to see a ton of progress that guys who don't have that self-discipline aren't going to see. Okay? So that's the first thing. Obviously, you know, basketball is completely different with how there's no NBA and no, I mean, high school season got canceled, college tournament got canceled. All these things happened and you know, we don't know when it's going to start back up again. Okay? We don't know when we're going to get to see LeBron win another title you know? Um, <laughs> so that, that of course is, is just major right now. And, and that kind of leads into the next point, which that completely messes with recruiting right now, especially for the class of 2021. So these upcoming seniors, you know, these guys are going to lose probably the whole AAU season. Maybe something will happen and they'll get the summer, but I mean, it's not looking great right now. So just with everything that's happening, this is unprecedented because right now, you know, we're in May or no, yeah, we're in May right now, which is crazy because last month was April. So that's usually a big live period. And I believe that they actually spread out the live period. So I think we went had another one in May. So maybe this actually, maybe it was to be this weekend, but it's, it's crazy to see that now. And then we talk about moving forward. Usually there's another big live period in the summer in July. We might not have that live period. Okay. So it's, it's, it's definitely changing the way that we have to go about viewing recruiting for that class and potentially even for 2022, we don't know what's going to happen going forward. So, and the reason I say that is because the way that recruiting is, is being done right now, I think there's a trend moving forwards towards this and Coleman, the, the guys that buy him basketball, we're talking about this too. And I completely agree with it, but recruiting is, is so online right now because again, coaches can't go anywhere. Coaches, like they like the NCAA is 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 not allowing them to go recruiting. Like they can't even go if they wanted to. So all the recruiting they can do is watching film and communicating with players on the phone or on email. Like that's all they can do. So that means one hundred percent of your basketball recruiting right now is is based on that. So that goes to it's all about having film. So the guys who have film right now are are the guys who are going to 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 be to be doing the best in recruiting because right now coaches can't come see you play. All that they can do is see what you've done so far. Okay. So, so it's very important. So moving forward guys, when we start to be able to play again, you've got to have film. Okay. If you're in high school, okay. If you're in middle school, you need to have film. If you're in high school, you absolutely need to have film. And the reason that that's so important is because situations like this. Now, obviously I'm not saying this is going to happen. Like I'm not saying that you could have predicted this, but what I'm saying is that, basketball in general is moving towards that where all of a sudden coaches are saying, okay, well we're recruiting online. If, if this all of a sudden, like we've already seen a trend towards this where you could, you reach out to a play, a coach, coach sees your film on huddle or on YouTube. Then coach comes to see you play all of a sudden that becomes so much more important. That becomes so much, so much bigger a factor because coaches right now, Whereas they might go to a tournament and they might find a random kid in 2021 that they've never seen before. And they, they might say, oh, wow, I want to recruit that kid. Now that's not going to happen. Now the only way that they're going to get that kid is if they see his film. Somebody sends them his film. Either he sends it, his coach sends it, whoever. Someone's got to send that kid's film or else that coach has no idea that that player exists or if he can play. And I think that basketball is going to move towards that permanently. Now, obviously, coaches are still going to go to tournaments, still going to see guys play. But I think the importance, the value of film, that in itself is never going to go away. 
and it's only going to continue to grow with, with what's happening right now. We're going to become more comfortable with film. Coaches are going to see – some coaches are going, to, are going to go through this whole recruiting for 2021, and they're going, to, they're going to like the outcome of it. They're going to say, okay, I think we got a good class this year, so maybe I'll focus a little bit more on this. I think that's something players need to understand. So if you're a younger guy and moving forward, make sure you get film. If you're in high school, get film. Get AU film. Now, it's a little bit different. You're going to want to get varsity film. So if you're not playing varsity yet, then you're going to want to have AAU film, okay? And I would say that's very important if you're, I would say as a sophomore moving forward, then you probably want to have film, again, just so you can, you have something to say, okay? You can say, hey, coach, you know, I'm interested in your program. This is, I'm this tall. This is my stats this year. Here's my, here's some film. Now the coach can watch you. He can either say, okay, this kid might have a chance to play here, or he can say, okay, this kid's not good enough. If he doesn't have your film, then he has no idea. And he's going to err on the side of, well, I don't know. So, eh. I mean, again, these coaches, like, their livelihood is based on who they bring in. They, they're, they're, they feed their families based on how 18 to 22-year-old kids play. So it's very important that they know what they're getting with the players. So film is just increasingly important as we continue to move on. So that's something you guys got to c- continue to think about. And with the whole recruiting thing, I, I had heard John Kyle Perry, uh, he was talking about how he actually doesn't like the summer recruiting. He doesn't like how it's such a big thing in July to go out to these big tournaments. He said that he wants it to be contained within the school year. So they have the summers off. So basically, they have their live periods in April or May, whenever. Then the June, July, maybe even August is, is dead. Okay, or at least June and July is dead. So you don't have any sort of recruiting at the D1, D2 level. And then you get back to school starting up in August, September, and maybe you have another live period after that. And it's funny because it, it, it's possible that we get, we get towards something like that, where we all of a sudden have some recruiting in the spring, and now all of a sudden school's out in the summer. All these school presidents and these coaches are like, well, you know what? We just did this last year. And everything turned out well. We didn't recruit it all in the summer. Why are we still doing that? Okay, and a guy like Kyle Perry is, is a proponent of that. And something that, that people have been talking about is potentially having a live period in September this year. So usually by the time you get to, to September, it's, a, it's dead. So coaches aren't really going. I mean, there's no tournaments really in September. So that was what people were talking about is potentially because there's not going to be any AAU most likely in the summer. Do they have a live period in September to where – these coaches can go watch these AAU teams play, and so that way they we're not completely going to miss out on on AAU, because of course everybody's going to struggle. I'm sure college coaches are still going to be getting their fair share of of guys, and a lot of guys did their work early, but they're still looking for guys. Okay, so it's important that, that they find that. And obviously, guys in 2021 who might not have film, might not have good film, that's going to be big for them as well. Okay, so I the other thing is if you're one of those guys, if you're in 2021 and you don't have film. So, I mean, what should you do? Like, well, what's the answer? Well, you know, the first thing is, is I would say still reach out to schools that, that you are interested in. And if you have a coach, you know, your coach, your high school coach, your AAU coach, what I would say is, you know, text them, email them, call them, say, hey, coach, would you mind recording just a quick video uh, kind of endorsing me as a player? Okay, my character, my work ethic, what skills I have, what I bring to the team. And then, you know, maybe just a quick one to two minute video from, you know, if you, you maybe your high school coach or AAU coach, maybe if you have a trainer. Uh, that, I think that that's going to be big because I know just from a character perspective, at least the coach can know that. The college coach will know, okay, well, at least if I bring this kid in, like he's a guy that his coaches can vouch for. That's better than setting him nothing, say, hey, coach, I want to play for you. But you don't have anything to, like, what are they going to say if you have nothing to send them? At least have that. So if you don't, if that's all you have, then maybe at that point you go to filming a workout. Okay, so you say, okay, you know what? I don't have any film of myself from, you know, I don't have any film from this past season, but maybe I'll film a workout or something. Okay, so you go to the gym and you, at, at, at the least, you know, that's still not film because there's no defense, obviously, but it, it's better than nothing. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the current situation. You know, be able to do that. Get on these coaches' radars. Okay, even if they say we can't, recruit you right now because we don't have film on you at least they know you exist okay and maybe they say you know what maybe this kid sends us home later we'll be interested so once you do that once we get back into playing it's it's point it's it's, it is point number one for you to get film 
Now, what this might mean is that before the season starts, you might need to go to some sort of showcase. I know I went to one before my senior year where they recorded every game and posted it on YouTube. So all I did after that was I just went through those games and I just found clips of me of my highlights and I just put that all together. And that's going to be an option for you guys. You just got to find something in your area that's going to be uh, that's going to be I'll let you to do that. So I think that's a big thing. And obviously, once the season gets here, get your film together, send it out. But ideally, you're going to have that film before the season even starts so that coaches can have you on their radars before the season begins. OK, because I think a lot of coaches next year are going to be out watching seniors play, whereas before they might have already had an idea who their who their targets are going into the senior their senior year. I think this year is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit later. It's going to, the process is going to take a little bit longer. It's going to be coaches who are going to be not quite sure on guys, and they're going to have to go see them play in the winter. Then they're going to be giving out their offers and stuff like that. Okay, that's going to be for some in some cases. For a lot for a lot of cases, they they are good. They've got their guys. They know their tar- they will know their targets by the time the season gets here. So do your work early if you can. That's going to be important. And along with that too. You know, with the NBA kind of moving backwards towards this December or towards, you know, a, I guess right now we're unsure of what we're going to be doing when it comes to finishing out the season. But, um, you know, I think, I think a big thing for players is understanding that, that it, everything trickles down. So that the NBA goes, college goes, and then high school goes, and that's how it is. So if the NBA ends up re- resuming the season late, we don't finish until, you know, July. Maybe they're able to start up in June, okay? I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, but maybe they're able to do that. They end up going through July, the beginning of August. So then they don't start up again until, you know, beginning of December, right? All of a sudden, that's going to change things for everybody because now that would mean that their season wouldn't end until about two months later. So all of a sudden you go from a June end next year to an August end. And obviously... The, I think the biggest thing that would affect is college guys who have to make a decision, am I going to go out or am I going to stay another year? Because when the season ends in June, now all of a sudden MB, you know, the draft is whenever, end of June or beginning of July. Uh, but now all of a sudden, these players have time to say, okay, you know what, beginning of June, I spend the whole month working out for teams, talking to different GMs and coaches, and you know, me and my, I can figure out where I'm going to go. Okay, And you know what? Whenever the cutoff date comes, June twentieth, whatever, and I, I get to choose whether I want whether or not I want to stay or go back to or uh, whether or not I want to go to the NBA or stay in school, I can make that choice. And now all of a sudden, I didn't miss much team stuff. I'm in the I'm in the gym. If I if I decide to go back to school, I have all July, August in the gym with with my college team. But now, if the NBA season doesn't end till August, I mean. And they don't have the drafts until, you know, a little bit after that. Well, what are these kids going to do? Okay, because you can't t- you can't n- make that decision in the end of August because school starts up in the middle of August for a lot of these these, these colleges. So that kind of that kind of gives us a, a little bit of a logistical situation right there. Well, what are we going to do with these guys who are going to leave or stay or trying to make that choice? That's going to that could affect it. So that's something to think about too moving forward. But you know, again, this is just a, a kind of a big thing in, in, in terms of what it's going to do down the line for basketball, most likely. So we'll see how that goes. But, you know, like I'm saying, basketball is going to favor the, the people who are prepared and disciplined moving forward, who come out of this, who putting in or being accountable to themselves, doing the work that they know they need to do. Those are the players that basketball is going to favor. OK, so right now it's it's time to build those habits if you haven't already. And even with things not being normal, those habits need to be built because then when things get back to normal, it's going to be easier for you to maintain those things. And again, the, that outside factor of your coaches and teammates being there is going to help you even more at that point. So there's players right now who don't have a hoop, who are still getting better, who are still working on their ball handling every day, who are still running sprints every day, doing push-ups, pull-ups, doing whatever they can do, whatever they have access to to get better. Okay, and and I think that develops not just that's gonna help you as a basketball player for sure, but it's gonna develop also that mindset of being self disciplined. I think that's a very very important thing that that it goes beyond just just you playing just you playing basketball. All of a sudden it becomes how does this affect me mentally moving forward because that 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 will translate to when you all of a sudden have access to all the other things you used to have access to. Now the way you approach it's gonna be different. You're gonna see a lot more improvement. So. 
at the end of the day, it, it comes down to doing what you can. That's all you can do. If you can look at, if you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I've done all that I can do, then you know that, that again, that that itself is going to develop that mindset that is going to take to be successful. So, I want to answer a question real quickly. Um, this comes from Zion. He says, "Hey, my name is Zion. I'm a subscriber, and I was just wondering if you could make a video on AAU camps such as Middle School Hoops TV, D Rich, NEO, etc., and if you think we should attend those." So, it's a good question. Uh, a question I get a lot actually. And I got a kind of a two-part response. These camps, they can be they can be good for a couple reasons. You know, obviously it can be exposure for you, though it depends on a, a couple different factors. First of all, it depends on how old you are as to whether or not I would tell you to go to these things. Obviously, middle school hoops TV, middle school camp. Um, that's one of those camps where, you know, I'm not I'm not a huge proponent of it. I, I am and I'm not. So the first thing it is it is exposure. Okay, there's plenty of guys who who get seen at those camps and all of a sudden they become ranked because that's where the the that's where the cameras are. Okay, but there's a lot of guys who go to those camps and spend a lot of money and it's like for what? Like wh why? Because here's the thing with those camps: they can either be really good for you or they can be a money grab. That's kind of my my thought on it. The other thing too that is a, a positive is that you'll get to see how you match up to high level competition. Okay. So you'll know when you go there, like, okay, where do I, where do I match up with some of these really good players in my class? I think that's a, a another positive thing. So you got to evaluate that yourself. And, you know, I think if you have, if you, if you can do that, if you can go to one of those camps, then there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I don't think, I don't see any issues with that at all. So you got to do research though, make sure the camp you're going to go to actually is going to have that high level of competition. Because if not, then going to an exposure camp and there's not great players there, it's like it's not not really a point. Especially if you're young. If you're young, then there's just no point because no one's gonna care. No one's gonna be there if there's not a high level of competition there. So, that being said, exposure camps are not important for are, are not that important for 99% of players. Okay, especially younger players, especially guys below like sophomore, junior year of high school. Like if you're younger than that, exposure camps most of the time are not important to you because most players aren't really that aren't good enough to to need exposure yet okay now, i'm not saying they won't get to that point but they might not be where they need to be as a seventh grader or an eighth grader or a ninth grader where they might still have a ways to go to develop players are so focused you know they put the cart before the horse the number one thing is is, is developing to the point where to where you can actually be a player that coaches want to recruit it can't just be oh i go to an exposure camp that means i'm going to get an offer no that's not how it works you are really good at basketball, then you get exposure, then you get the offer, okay? That's how it works. So before you ask yourself, do I need to go to an exposure camp? Ask yourself, hey, is there a, is there a skills camp near me that is really good that I can go to? That might make me better. That might, make get, that might get me exposure down the line because I'm better. Ask yourself that question, okay? Now, if you are, that, if you are skilled like that, if you, if you are one of the best players in your area and you, know, you might have the opportunity to get exposure at a camp like that, cool. But if you're not that player, be honest with yourself and understand that the important part is get is being is developing yourself, especially as a younger player. You know, I always say like if honestly, if you're below like your sophomore year of high school, I wouldn't even worry about recruiting at all. In fact, for most players, if you're not a high major player, you really don't need to even worry about it until you're like going into your junior year. That's that's when I would say it really it starts to matter. Um for most players, okay? Again, for some players, who, uh, the high major kids are going to get offers when they're in sixth grade, okay? That's how it is. If you're going to be going to Duke, North Carolina, mo most likely, most of those guys, those guys you see on TV, guys get drafted, they're going to get offers when they're seventh grade, eighth grade. That's how it is. Some of them slip through the, the cracks, obviously. You know, obviously, you have a guy like, you know, John Morant, who went to Murray State, who wasn't highly recruited. And you got guys like that. But for the most part, you're gonna have guys who get those offers early. They're gonna to go to those camps, get offers early because they're. You can just see down the line they have freak athleticism or freak height or or whatever it is that they're good at. But for the most part, focus on your development. That's what I would say. And really, it, that's why I say it's better look for you to go to those camps that are gonna help you with your development moving down the line, as opposed to going those camp, to those camps that are just focused on exposure, where you're just gonna go play. Okay, most kids don't need exposure. At that age, though, it is good, like I said, to be able to compete against players who are really good to see where you match up with them. 
okay, so going forward, you know what you need to do to, to, to work on, you know what you need to do to, to be able to compete and, and be better than those guys, okay? That should be your reason for going to one of those camps if you're that young, if you're in middle school especially. Don't even think about the exposure part. Think of, okay, how do I, how do I match up against players in my class, against guys my age around the country, and take that and get better from it and then use that to propel your development forward say okay now what do I, what do i need to do to get in the, like when i get in the gym what do i need to do to get better don't focus on the wrong things what it comes down to your focus should be 100 percent on being the best player you can be not your exposure especially when you're that young so i've talked about this a little bit but i i want to go back to how to maximize your quarantine and this is something that we already have talked about a little bit being self-disciplined, being holding yourself accountable, but you want to make sure that, that you, you get the most you can out of this in this time that we have. So like I said before, guys, it starts with knowing what your goals are. So, so I specifically want to talk about next season. So, so what are your goals for next season? What do you want to get out of next season? You know, and, and again, this is something that like, you know, I, I won't tell you what your goal should be. That's what you got to think about for yourself. So what are your goals moving forward? And then it goes to, you know, what do you want to do long term? Okay, so you have your, your next season goals and long term, what do you want? Those things that you should know. Write them down if you need to, but you got to know them for sure. And then you got to determine what it's going to take for you to actually achieve those things. Okay, it's not good enough to just know them. If you don't know what to do, then it's gonna you're going to find it difficult to maintain that level of, of commitment to it because you don't know if you're actually getting closer to where, to where you want to be. So it's important that you know that as well. And then you got to know, what am I going to do now to move towards those things? What can I do every day to move towards those things? So, so you got to figure out, today I'm doing this workout because I need, I need to get better at this. Today I'm going to watch a breakdown on this player because I, I want to get better at this specific skill. That's something that's very important. And you, you, can't, you, you can't skip that part. And that part becomes important because you have it written down. You know what you want to get to. And because of that, your commitment to it is going to raise up, is going to be higher. You're going to be able to hold yourself accountable more easily because now you know, like, okay, I need to do this today. Like, I need to do this. Now there's no excuse saying, I didn't know, look, I didn't know what to do or I thought I was doing enough. But now you know what you need to do. Okay, so, so that, that's an important part too. And I think this goes to a bigger part where a bigger point, which is, you know, the players who are going to succeed long term are the ones who don't need situations to be perfect for them to still get the work in. And this is, you know, I think about this too with just myself. Like, obviously, it's not perfect for anybody right now. And I still think to myself, like, okay, you know what? I, I just want to wait till everything's better, back to normal, and then I'll, I'll do this. Um, but, but you have to understand that the play, like the people who do things now when it's not perfect. Those are the people who are actually going to keep on doing things when things are back to being normal, right? Because things will never be perfect completely. Right now, it's obvious that things are not great, okay? So it's obvious. But when, when, when the quarantine's over and, you know, school is back and everything is how, how, how it is, how it usually is, there's still going to be things that are going to be not perfect. And then at that point, the people who are making those excuses are going to find new excuses to make, okay? So you want to break yourself out of that habit, okay? So... You, you can't wait for things to be perfect because they never will be. They never will be perfect. And, you know, I love I love reading about guys who have overcome significant things to get to where they are. And, you know, I think one of the best examples of that is a guy like LeBron. You know, you look at LeBron, and he grew up in Akron, didn't have a lot of money at all growing up. You know, he there, there were days where he was hungry. And I think I remember reading that he, he at one point when he was in, like, first second grade he missed like 80 days of school or something like that and like it's just a bunch of craziness and i he, i read that he uh you know at some points really he was technically homeless living on people on you know friends and family's couches and stuff like that and when he was nine his mom sent him to live with one of his coaches because it would just be a better situation for him so i mean obviously that's just intense right like that, that's crazy that a kid that age has to go through all that before the age of nine and you might think to yourself like wow like you know, that kid didn't have much growing up. Like you probably like, you wouldn't expect that that kid all of a sudden becomes the best, play like in my opinion, the best player in NBA history. And it, it's, it's crazy to think about that, that sort of, that sort of revelation because, you know, everyone has to go through something, but not a lot of people have to go through all of that, right. In terms of just, just 
all the poverty and and all the stuff he has to go through as 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 a kid at that age. So despite things not being perfect, though, LeBron overcame that and and propelled himself forward to becoming an NBA legend, becoming one of the best players in the history of the game. And clearly, obviously, LeBron is physically gifted. There is no denying that one of the most one of the most gifted athletes we've ever seen. Okay, but there's a lot of guys out there who are physically gifted. There's a lot of guys out there who are also have those those sorts of that height, that athleticism, maybe not to his degree, but there are guys out there who also have physical gifts, but they don't achieve one percent of what LeBron has. Okay? And a lot of those guys have come from much better situations where, you know, they, they might have had a, a steady home, you know, steady family situation. They might have had access to, you know, whatever they needed. There was no shortage of money or anything like that. But be, despite having those advantages and things being more perfect, they don't achieve as much as the person who didn't have as much, didn't grow up in a, per, in a perfect situation at all. And I, I think the question is, is why is that? Like, why is that possible? Obviously, that's not every situation, but how is it possible that somebody who didn't have all the advantages growing up is, is where he is now? And I think that having to overcome imperfect situations is one of the most important things that you can do to propel yourself forward. And, you know, the reason that that it is because when you start to develop the mindset that, that, you know, you, when that, even when things aren't ideal, you're going to get it done. All of a sudden, when things become better, you, you are able to just level up the way that you work because now you have things you didn't have before, right? You're still working like, like your work is like, listen, I don't care that someone might have more than me. I'm going to beat them. Okay. I'm going to be better than them. Then all of a sudden you, you get those things and you still maintain that mindset well, now the rate at which you're going to improve is just going to be astronomical. It's going to be crazy. And, you know, when you approach, the, when you approach the, everything, when you approach your work with the mindset the, of, you know, regardless of the situation, regardless of anything on the outside, I'm going to get it done. That is such a powerful thing, a pow- such a powerful way to think. And that's why a guy like LeBron is where he is now, because regardless of the circumstances that he had, regardless of all of that stuff, the way he worked at it didn't change. It stayed the same the whole time. And I think that the when the only option is is to succeed, when you say, you know what, listen, my family, you know, we're in poverty right now. The only way to get my to get my mom out of out of poverty is to be successful. I mean, that in itself, like that's just crazy, right? That that's a crazy drive that you're gonna have just just from that alone. Okay, so not everybody's gonna have that story, right? Not everyone's gonna be grow up like that. So, but that does not mean that you don't have to overcome imperfect situations. That that's my point. My point is not that you have to go through everything LeBron went through. My point is that you need to go through when you when they come when when you get to them imperfect situations. You need to to get through those. And you need to use that to tr- to propel you forward. This right now, great example: the quarantine. Compl- I mean, the definition of an imperfect situation for everybody. Okay, but the way that you work right now is the way that you're going to work long term. Okay, so if you can if you can if you can approach your work with saying I'm gonna get it done, if you can do that now, now think about when things get back to being better. All of a sudden, it's like wow, you know the way that you're gonna be able to get things done at that point is gonna be crazy. So you need to make sure that that you 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 embrace that. It's not perfect, but a lot of times the the best players didn't have it perfect growing up. Okay, but they they were able to deal with the mindset that they're gonna overcome it, and because of that, look at where they are now. So. That, that's how we're going to be able to tell who really wants it and who doesn't is is who was working when it wasn't perfect. Who was still getting, who was still improving, who was still looking for ways to get better when it wasn't ideal, okay? So, you know, approach these, these imperfect and difficult times with the understanding that, you know, you can become significantly better if you choose to take action on those things. So that that's very important and, and and a point that I want to bring up regarding the, the whole quarantine situation, I think that's going to be big going down going down the line for a bunch of players. And so I got another player, another question actually from from Abby. This is actually a couple weeks. This actually I think was my first podcast. I showed this, this comment, and um, so I want to get to it. She said, uh, specific question: How do you properly study NBA film? I don't want I don't have much of my own, so I'm trying to watch other players: Kobe White, Morant, Zoe, Shai Gilgeous Alexander. Try and implement those into my game. 
How would I get that film study to transfer and quickly to? Okay, so this is a great question, actually. And I'm going to use this to kind of pivot into another point I want to talk about. But there's a couple ways that you can go about this. And the first thing is that watching NBA film is, is great when you're trying to study, like, the moves that players use. Because we're going to go get into kind of the differences between, you know, the NBA and college. But, you know, if you want to watch how LeBron uses the pick and roll or how Jason Tatum sets up his step back or how Klay Thompson comes off of an off ball screen for a catch and shoot three or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to watch something specific, you know, how CJ McCollum uses his floater, all those different things. That's great. That that's, that's the best reason to watch NBA film is to watch how these guys do it. I mean, these guys are the best in the world at what they do. So I would say if that's what you're going to do, you know, think about your own playing style. Think about how you, the way you play or the way that you want to play, okay? And then find players who play similarly to that. That's going to be the, one of the biggest things when it comes to actually being able to break down and transfer that film that you watch to your own game is don't watch players who you don't play like, okay? Because there might be players who do things you can't do, right? Or that's not in your game. And if you're not if you're not working to to develop that, then, you know, if you're if you're a big guy but you're watching – you know, John Wall, well, I mean, how, like, maybe you should be watching, you know, Joel Embiid or uh, maybe Anthony Davis or somebody along those lines. You know, you f figure out who you play like and then be able to break down film watching players like that. I think that's how you're going to do that. I prefer to use individual game film if I'm watching an NBA player. So, like, if I, if I want to watch, uh, if I want to watch Damian Lillard highlights, I'm not going to go to Damian Lillard's season highlights because – those tend to be his most extreme highlights, right? Those are the ones where he crosses over three people and then dunks on a center, right? That doesn't, that's really not really going to help me, okay? Because I'm not going to do that. And most players aren't going to do that. So just watching highlights of their crazy plays, right? I'm, I'm going to watch LeBron, you know, where he had that play because of the Sixers where he split the ball between his legs and between Tristan Thompson's legs, went down and dunked it. Like, that's just not, that's not really helpful to anybody. Great play, but. That's not when we talk about breaking down film. That's not what we're looking for. Okay, so we're not we're not watching for highlights. We're watching for skills we can take and start to implement, start to understand more. So that's why I prefer to watch individual games. You know, I'll watch a game where you know I, I was watching Damian Lillard yesterday, where I believe he had sixty against the Lakers this year, or maybe it was forty eight. He had a crazy game against the Lakers. I, I was watching that game and and I was able to break down some specific skills for. Uh, the my VIP film room in the perimeter score system. So on that point, actually, that's coming out. When you guys see this, that'll be coming out tomorrow. The perimeter score system and everything will be dropping tomorrow. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure you send me a DM uh, because that's going to be crazy. So be on the lookout for that. But that's coming soon. I'll, I'll probably talk about that again at the end, but wanted to bring that up. But again, that that's what I like to do when I watch them. I watch individual games of players because it's way easier to find those skills that you can actually translate, okay, as opposed to the crazy highlights. So, so that, that's what you need to do. And, and what I will also say is pick what you do. So what you're looking to improve, maybe you want to be better at getting to the basket. Okay. Watch how CJ McCollum gets to the basket. Watch how Luka Doncic gets to the basket. When you're watching these guys film, don't just be like, Oh, I'm just going to watch Luka Doncic do whatever. I want to watch his highlights. And then when I see him get to the basket, how does he do it? Okay. That's something you gotta you gotta be aware of. You know, I, I'm not just I'm not just gonna watch LeBron James highlights. I'm gonna watch how LeBron James uses the pick and roll. That's what I care about. So go into watching your film with a purpose. Now, if you find something else that you wanna also watch, that's cool. But have a purpose for your film as you watch. So that's kind of how how I go about breaking down NBA film. But again, when I watch NBA film, it's really just to learn individual skills, and it has a place. It's a good thing, but. You know, I also want to talk about why I think that players, especially, you know, high school players should be watching more college film than they watch NBA film. Okay, and there's a couple reasons for that. But, you know, the high school game is much more similar to the college game than it is the pro game. Okay, it's much more similar. And that's for, for a couple reasons. But first of all, the defensive three-second call is a big one. So in high school and college, there is no defensive three-second call. So you can plant a big guy in the paint on defense. He doesn't have to move. Okay, so that automatically changes the spacing because in the NBA, you 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 do have that call. If the, if a big guy stands in the paint for three seconds, the offense the the offense gets a free throw. So you can't do that. So the spacing is it's way more open. Okay, also the court's bigger, but 
the, the, there's more there's more open space because this the the lane is not clogged the whole time. Okay, so it's that's a little bit different. Also, just the playing style change is, is different in the NBA as, as opposed to college and high school. Now, the thing is, high call or the pro game tr- it always drips down to to the lower level. So it's going to start in the NBA, it's going to go to college, then high school. Okay, so uh, you'll see that the way that you know the majority of teams mirror how the NBA plays with ball movement, threes, all that stuff. That's how the majority of college and, and high school teams play, is they want to be able to play fast with good ball movement and be able to shoot. That's how the NBA is. The difference, though, is that the NBA has way more ball screens and isolation than most college and high school teams will have. And that's because the simple reason is the NBA players are incredibly talented. So you want to have a guy, if you have a guy like, you know, Damian Lillard on your team or CJ McCollum, you're going to set them a million ball screens because they're so good, right? If they get an inch of space, then all of a sudden, I mean, man, those guys are going to be able to score at will, okay? At the high school and college level, you don't really have guys who are on that level the majority of the time, okay? And the NBA has so many players who can play like that, who can, who can play off of ball screens. You know, when Isaiah Thomas played for the Celtics, I mean, he was incredible off of ball screens. And, you know, a guy like LeBron, you know, you get LeBron on ball I mean, man, you get LeBron on ball screen, it, it's he, he is incredible at that. And that's why the NBA is a little bit different because you're, you're not going to see as many ball screens and, and you know, isolation as you're going to see at, in the NBA level compared to high school and college. Not to say you won't see any. Obviously, both levels, all three levels use ball screens and a little bit of isolation, but you're going to see way more at the NBA level because players are better. So it's not going to quite tell you exactly how to score. It's going to show you what the skills these guys have, but you – you know, unless you're Damian Lillard and you, you have that sort of ability, you're not going to be getting, that's not going to how you're going to be scoring at the high school level or the college level. So th- that that's something that you should be be aware of. So, you know, that's why I, I think you should watch a more college film because you're going to have that, that additional defender in the paint, but also you're going to have to see the way that college is really predicated on ball movement. That's how high school is too. If you want to score, you need to, you need to know how to score off of good ball movement. So being able to shoot, knowing when to attack, you know, how to attack, it's different in college compared to the NBA, okay? And it's much more similar to the high school level if you're watching college film as well. So be aware of that. Now, when I say college film, I'm, I'm specifically talking about teams like Villanova, Virginia, Texas Tech, schools that aren't necessarily the most talented. They don't have the one-and-done guys every year, but they run a great system, and they play great basketball. And, and obviously, there are, those schools do have talented players. I mean... Nova's had teams with guys like, you know, DiVincenzo, and um, they've had guys like uh, Brunson and Josh Hart, and I mean, countless NBA guys on those teams. But, you know, for the most part, they, they, don't ha- they aren't having those, you know, top 10 recruits on their team, okay, because that is a little bit different, too. Not to say that there's no uh, place to watch Duke and North Carolina and them play. That's cool, too. It, just know that it's not, it's, it's not the same because you have guys who are just ultra-talented. Okay, as compared to teams who have to actually play, like you have to play great basketball. Now, again, I'm not trying to throw shade out of those teams. They both have Hall of Fame coaches, but it's different when you have incredibly talented players. Okay, so that that's my biggest thing when it comes to to watching the college game. And you know, I th- that comes to people ask me, or, or you might think to yourself, like, okay, so if if you want to, if you're telling me that I should watch more college film then how come I don't see college film on your channel? Like, why do you only break down NBA film? It's a good question. Uh, it's a couple reasons, actually. So number one is it's, it's just easier to find NBA film in terms of like highlights and stuff like that, breakdown, stuff like that. You can find full college games and you can find college film breakdown for sure. Like it's out there, but it's just NBA is just such a big business. And th- there's a reason for that. And the reason is, that the NBA wants it to be like that. The NCAA does not. So th- that means that, like, I, I remember I posted a, a video a while ago, and it had a clip from, it was a, it was a Duke game, actually. It was a, it was a Zion clip. And it was maybe 15 seconds long. I posted it on one of my videos, uh, and it, was, it got copyright claimed by the ACC network. So it took, they took away, it was an eight-minute video, and they took away all my monetization on it because I posted a 50-second clip of a Duke game, which 
to be out of an eight minute video, it was an eight minute video, and 15 seconds of it were, were ACC Network film, and they demonetized it because of that. So that means that to me, that's like, okay, well, now I'm never going to post another AC clip in any of my videos ever again because I'm not going to let you just take away my monetization because of a 15 second clip. That's ridiculous, right? Meanwhile, the NBA, notice how everyone posts NBA clips because the NBA wants them to. The NBA is not going to take away the monetization. They're going to say, you know what? We appreciate the free advertising you're going to give us with this. We're, our game is going to continue to grow. More people are going to watch it and we're going to make more money. So thank you. So now all of a sudden, the NBA is, is becoming the biggest. I mean, within the next few years, it's going to be the highest grossing sport in the world. It's already the most popular sport in the world. Soccer is borderline there, but it's just not in America. So I think basketball is probably going to be the number one sport very soon. But that's because the NBA understands the importance of getting, putting their product in front of everybody possible. So they want people to share their game. The NCAA, as usual lags far behind the NBA, which is why the NBA is going to say, okay, we're going to make more money than you. And we're also going to take all of your top prospects and put them in the G League within the next few years. So, you know, per usual, NCAA is is falling behind and the NBA is moving forward. So that's a big reason why. But again, that's not the only reason why, because I can find ESPN film from, you know, college basketball. And I'll probably will start to break down more college film as well, because I think that's important too. Actually, in the 20 points per game blueprint that I have, I do break down a lot of college film. Actually, a team that you are going to want to watch is uh, that UMBC team from a couple of years ago in the tournament that beat Virginia. That team, man, if you want to see how to play good basketball, watch them. Go watch UMBC from that year. You can watch highlights, breakdowns from them. They were just such a well, just, just such a well-oiled team offensively. Moved the ball so well. Had a bunch of guys who could shoot, drive and kick. I mean, it's just beautiful basketball. So, that's one of my one of the big reasons for watching college basketball. But you know all that all that to say, watch NBA film. There's there's a place for it, of course. Like I'm gonna continue to watch guys who who I think are great and learn from them. That's super important. But also don't ne don't neglect the college game. If you want to learn how to really play basketball, watch college basketball. You need to do that because that's gonna help translate to you as a younger player. So you know that's uh. That, that's all I've got today. You know, I've got a couple questions. So like I always say, guys, you got questions for me, drop them in the, the comment section, send me a DM on Instagram, and uh, I'll definitely talk about it if I haven't talked about it yet. If I've already talked about it, then maybe I'll talk about it again. We'll see. I don't know. But like I said, if you're an Apple podcast, I would really appreciate you guys would leave a review. And real quick, again, like, like I said before, actually to uh, tonight, so tomorrow morning technically when you're seeing this, because it's going to come out on a Sunday. Monday at midnight, the perimeter score system is going to be open for players to join. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to get going with this. I know I've gotten a lot of messages from guys who are, who are really excited to get their hands on it as well. And, you know, again, for those of you who don't know, the perimeter score system is a year-round training system that it has off -season, an off-season phase, pre-season phase, in-season phase. And I think it, it's going to be one of the most complete basketball training systems that you can get. And it really is going to focus on the ability to, to, you know, make shots off the dribble, off the catch, ball handling, finishing, be able to create separation, um, scoring moves, all, all a whole bunch of different things that's going to address throughout this entire program. I think it's going to be very, very complete, and it's going to really change a lot of players' games. So, again, I know a lot of you guys are excited to get going with that. And like I said, if you don't know what I'm talking about or you want to learn more about it, send me a DM, leave a comment, and I'll make sure I get you that information. And along with that, there's also the 20 points per game blueprint, which I had alluded to earlier, where I'm breaking down how to score, okay? Break down film. I give you guys uh, lessons on what exactly it takes to be a scorer. And this is not just like really, you know, out, you know uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but this is not just like really uh, out there sort of stuff, right? This is like legitimate, tangible information you can take to apply to yourself and, and become a better scorer, right? And, and it's, it's, it's about becoming a guy who can score consistently and finding easy points because that's going to give you a baseline of scoring to where you also add in your skills you're going to develop. I mean, you're going to be able to score way easier than you have been before. So, again, big thing for a lot of players. And then also the Mental Toughness Masterclass, which is going to be all about mental toughness, developing a great mentality and getting in the zone, being able to really maximize your skills, right? Because if you have all the skills but mentally you aren't there, you're not going to see the results that you want to have. 
Okay, so that's another thing that is going to really help a lot of players. And then the last thing that I also had talked about is the VIP Scoring Secrets film breakdown, where I break down a bunch of different film for NBA players where I talk about their moves and how you can actually apply those things. So that was really fun to make, actually, and, and, and I really think that's going to help a lot of players too. So really excited to get going with that. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, make sure you leave a comment. Or just check out my Instagram because it'll be it'll be I'll have more information on there too. So, uh, but for sure, you know, excited to get going with that. If you guys stuck to the end, I really appreciate you guys listening. And you know, like I just said, any questions, make sure you let me know. I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace.